My name's Kyle Cashel, as everybody knows. Um, I grew up right here in Sampson County. I grew up in Garland and, well, I lived in Garland. Let me take that back. I lived in Garland, went to school in Bladen County because my mother taught school was over there. Grandparents lived at White Oak and farmed, and so I spent a lot of time at White Oak also. Um, I am married now. I have three children. I have a, um, my wife's name is Christy Cashel, Christy Peterson Cashel. Um, my uh, oldest daughter is 14. My middle child is 10. And then Lathan's with me tonight. He's 14. They would have loved to have been. Lar I mean, what did I say? That upset you, huh? Seven. Um, Christy, Christy would have loved to be here tonight, but we've got one play of baseball in Elizabeth Town. Well, we've got one that has a dance recital Saturday, so they're getting, um, they're doing a lot of practicing this week. And so we're, like usual, in different directions. Um, I was a paramedic for almost uh, 17 years. I started out in Brunswick County for about a year and a half, left there, and went to the city of Lumberton as a firefighter paramedic. I uh, went left there, had a big change in life, uh, went through a divorce, it was kind of rough. I had two children full time, one that was six months old and one that was almost four. And um, I had to come out home to get some help. I, it, it was tough trying to work a 24 hour shift and have two children that were that young trying to, to get them to where they need to go and me be able to be at work. And so we, uh, I came back. I've, it really enjoyed coming back working in Sampson County. It was like coming back home, and it was like being on a vacation from what I was used to. I was used to 12 to 20 calls in a 24-hour period, or come over here and run eight calls in a 24-hour period, and I'm like, thank God, why didn't I do this before now? And um, I grew up farming. My um, father farmed with my grandparents. We had, uh, we raised cows corn, beans, soybeans, and also we had about 500 sows on the ground until I was about 16. And we sold pigs every week, just like it was a, just like a, being on a, a regular sow farm these days in the houses, but all it was on the ground. I've learned, uh, learned more than what I thought I would growing up, you know. It, it's like once you're in farming, you're around it, it's like, it's like a part of you. And I'm not a person that was gonna sit around and just watch days go by. That's just not me. I like to be out and about moving. I, um, we, at, still farming at this time, we have, we've been planting corn and soybeans. Um, the corn this year, we're not gonna plant corn if we do, it's going to be a very little, and I've got another week this side, and it's not looking too good on it. Um, mostly what we're going to plant this year is soybeans, we're going to have some watermelons. We are in the action right now of changing over a little over 90 acres to being fenced in to raise, go back to raising cows, something that I can handle by myself for the most part without having to have so much help day in, day out. And... Um, it, I, growing up with the cows, and it was, it was something I really loved. And so, you know, I want the children to, to be able to, to grow up, to, be, to see how it is to, to take a calf from being, from it being born up to time to eat it. And uh, we had, uh, we raised some, some hogs on the ground that we ate. And most children, they would name them and all that. Mine named them. But one was pork chop, one was bacon, one was sausage. That's, that's the kind of children I've raised. But um, in uh, a roundabout shell, I worked 24 hour shifts. I farmed and I have a sawmill. That's what I did on an everyday basis. Plus I had the, two, the three children and being, having a household, a family. I didn't slow down. I didn't take time. I didn't, I missed bukus and major 
events with family, the children, with them growing up, school events, sports events, because working 24 hour shifts, you don't realize, you know, that people say, well, you, you, uh, you work 24 on, you're off the next day. Well, that next day, there's nothing gonna be going on that day. It's always the day before, the day after when you're at work. That's when things are gonna be going on. Um, and so since I've got hurt, I've got time for baseball games, events, school events. You know, before I didn't take time for family. I didn't take time to slow down to tea even for myself, much less to do what I needed to be as a husband and a father. Um, <coughs> how do I change that? Just hit. That's cool. Okay. On uh, October 20th, 2014, was like any other day. I got off that morning at 6 a.m. and I came home. Well, coming home, I helped my wife get the children ready for school, change clothes, and I had a list, like usual, about a mile long of things I needed to get done, things that had to be done that day. Nothing could wait. I had bean, uh, corn that needed to be picked. I had boards that needed to be solved, an order that needed to go out. And I was telling Chris, she said, no matter what you do, do not forget to go to the bank. I was like, okay. We had got to the point, we'd bought land, we we're fixing to build a house. Well, all the paperwork, Christy had done all that on her own as far as getting all the legwork done. I just had to get there and sign the paperwork. It had been approved, the loan had been approved and everything. I just had to sign it so we could go ahead to the next step, go ahead and start getting, getting ready to build. Well, I had uh, the corn, we, you know, it's got to be dry before you can pick it. You can't just go out there first thing in the morning when it's got dew on it or if it's wet, you got to wait and let it dry before you can pick it because it'll mold or, or rot. Well, I said, well, I'll start out with the sawing. Jumped on the sawing, got it finished, got it completed, and I moved on to getting everything ready to get, start picking. Well, getting ready to start picking, you say, well, you know, you just get on a piece of equipment, you take off. No, you've got to check everything. You've got to check your oil, your fluids, fill fuel in it. And then with a corn picker, do you have to grease it every day? Because the way we do it, this corn that we snapped, every bit of it would be snapped. We sold it for deer corn, bear corn, and also for cow feeds, hog feeds, things like that. We, uh, we didn't, we didn't pick it with a regular combine where it's off the cob. Well, I got all that done and everything's dried off. The, everything's greased, everything's checked, everything's good to go. Well, this picker that we're using, the, it's probably one of the newest models that you could get. However, it was made in the 80s. And so if you figure the 80s, you know, if it was 84, 94, 2004, 2014, it's already 30, 30 years old at that point. Well, the only way you're gonna keep a piece of equipment like that is by keeping it up. I had an older gentleman with me that day and he was there in the field with me. We started picking. I picked a grain trailer full of corn. Let me get back to the next one to show you this picker. I'm sorry. This is a two row new idea corn picker. Um, they don't make anything newer to do the same thing with. And, it, and really, you know, in the older days, they would do it like that, put it in a a corn crib or either in an open grain bin or under a shelter or in something that way to use it for feeds throughout the year. The, um, I had uh, started picking, is there a, there's not a pointer on that is there? The, um, I started picking that day, I made 
one trailer full, everything was going good. Picked it, loaded it, pulled out in the field, unhooked the trailer, hooked to another one. Well, the gentleman that was with me, he said, while you get started, I'm gonna go to Garland and get us a hamburger. I said, okay, that's great, yeah. Well, he takes off, he leaves, nothing unusual. I'm used to running equipment by myself. I'm used to being there by myself. I'm not used to having people around me, a big audience watching me while I'm work. Well, I got about halfway through with one of the second trailer, about half full, and I hit a wet spot in the field. Well, all four tires on the tractor were spinning, front and rear. I'm not going anywhere. Well, if you get a four-wheel drive, if you get a tractor stuck, you got your hands full. If you get one that's four-wheel drive stuck, you just got twice as much hands full stuck. It's terrible trying to get it out. Um, so I stopped it, I got off, I went around to at the grain trailer and unhooked it. So I'll pull off, I'll pull out to the end of the field, we'll get another tractor or truck, something, we'll come back and we'll hook to that, we'll just pull it on out, you know, no big deal. Well, I got to the end of this field and I'm walking around the machine, tractor's running, motor on the tractor's running, picker is not. Well, I'm walking around it, I'm cleaning it off, knocking the, knocking the uh, dust off of it or fodder, some people would call. Just cleaning it up because I don't want to take a lot of trash from one field to another field or vice versa or move any kind of, of extra weed seed. It's already hard enough to keep them down. Well, I walked around to the header um, and I saw a morning glory. How many of you know what a morning glory is? Nobody in here? You know you don't. A morning glory, if you don't know, is a vine, long vine, has a pretty purple looking flower on it. And it is a real tough viney vine. It's, it's, it's hard to break, it's hard to cut. If you get it tangled around your foot, it'll throw you down. Well, there was one that was laying in this area right here and was hanging to here, out on this side. Well, I pulled on it, didn't come loose. Well, I wrapped my hand around it, and by the time I pulled on it, it pulled on me. It grabbed my right hand, and it pulled me down into that inside header closer, closer to y'all, where y'all saying y'all's right side, and down and up. In that area, in the open area, there are rollers. You can see some of the chains here that are coming out. There are rollers that are going up. And they're just like the outside of the header. It is at a V. The rollers are going up and they're spinning in to take the corn stalks down through it. Well, my right hand is going into these rollers down and up. The further it gets to the top, or the closer it gets to the top, the tighter that those rollers are getting. And I'm doing everything I can to get my hand out of it. Pulling, it, I wasn't getting anywhere. Well, I took my leg and I put it on the side and I took all my force and pulled backwards. Well, when I did, my hand came out. That's great, right? Not exactly. Well, when I came out of this in here, I fell backwards. I hit this drive shaft here. It's spinning, it threw me back forward. Well, when it did, I was on one foot. I lost my balance. And I've got an arm that is crushed to mid forearm. Compound fracture is bleeding. I've got blood on this side of this picker now. It was already slick to start with. Now I've got blood on it and it's twice as slick. I'm doing everything I can to try to get my hand on something and my foot was over in the here, which right here, this part right here, there is a belt that has lip on it about this, about every two foot that is going up at an angle into this part here. Well, my foot was on that belt. My hand was here trying to catch myself. Well, on one foot, I couldn't hold it. My foot traveled over to the inside or the outside header on this side where 
these teeth that y'all are seeing back here, the light spots here, those are chains on both sides that are going up. And they've got teeth on them about every six to eight inches. Or a little shelf like that grabs the stalk, pulls it in. Well, it grabbed my foot. I had a boot on. It pulled my foot down into it, that roller. Well, the roller caught my boot. Well, now I've got a right arm that's crushed. I'm trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do. My right foot, I've lost my balance. Well, all I could do at that point was by his fault. So I fell backwards. And if you'll see this header right here, you see, you see, you can see grass and all that up under it. Most of the time, when you're picking with it, it's down closer to the ground, probably running about four to six inches off the ground. I thought, oh, well, you know, this is it right here. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm going to be. This is where they're going to find me at. I locked my rear end around this center header here on this cone. My leg is draped over into this, and I'm laying flat in front of this. Well, at that point, yeah, there's a lot of things going through your head. You know, um, I'm gonna bleed to death right here. This is it, pretty much. Uh, my children, Christy's gonna have a hard time raising them, real hard time. She's gonna be by herself. She's gonna have to raise two boys and a girl. And I was thinking to myself, uh, Dear Lord, you know, what am I going to do? Well, I said, you know, thank you, Lord, for what you have done for me, for looking after me, for giving me what you've given me. Thank you for the three boys and, you know, help Christy and please look after them. This is, uh, this is it. I said, but dear Lord, if you have me coming out of this or want me to come out of it, Show me what you want me to do to get out of it. And I laid back down, got my breath about me. I took my belt off and got it, got it off and got it tied around my right arm to control the bleeding. Got it tightened down, I laid back. And I felt something on my stomach vibrate. I was like, what in the world is that? I'm laying on my back now. It was a cell phone. It was laying right on my stomach, just like this. My father-in-law was calling me. He worked at Goodyear in Febble. I told him, I said, Buss, I'm in a bind. I said, my right arm's pretty much amputated, my right leg's fixed, and I got to have some help. All right, bye. Well, this phone, ladies and gentlemen, was always around here on this side with the clip on it. How in the world it got to my stomach? I won't never know. Because of my belt coming this way, it looks like it would have been behind me, not on top of my stomach up here. Well, he called, I've got a uh, couple guys that helped me work with EMS, fire, or sheriff's department, PD. Eddie Carter, y'all probably know Big Eddie, it works with Clinton Police Department. He, a uh, pretty good friend of mine, we've been close since we were little. He was working here in town. My father-in-law called him. He said, Kyle's hung in the corn picker, you got to have some help. So Eddie called it in and headed that way toward me. Well, when I got off the phone with him. I'm doing everything I can. If you get your phone wet, how hard is it to open? It's, it's terrible. You know, you're sitting there, you're sliding, 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 sliding. You can't get anything to happen. Well, I'm wiping it off on my shirt, trying to get it clean enough, dry it off good enough with all the blood that was on it so that I could open it. When I finally got it open, I called 911. And uh, Nancy and... Roberta, Roberta Parker answered the phone. I said, look, I said, I said, this is Kyle, I'm in a bind. I got to have some help. I said, my right arm's pretty much amputated, my right leg's feet, and be good. He can get me a helicopter headed this way. 
You want a helicopter? Yes. Go ahead and give me a helicopter headed this way. I got, I, I got a head of blood. She said, okay. Well, they went ahead and they launched a helicopter. They called for, uh, for EMS, fire, search department. Well, I don't know if any of you know Jason Riley. Jason Riley just so happened that his stomach was tore up and he had to go home. Well, since he had to go home, he was inside using a restroom and he heard all this commotion going on on his radio. Well, he called him. He said, what is going on? They said, and they told him. Well, Jason Riley, I was approximately a half a mile off the highway. Well, Jason Riley was about 300 yards through the woods from where I was at, at home. So he come around, he went to where I was at. And he come around the tractor and I was laying in the middle, picker running, tractor running. And he said, I said, he said, Bo, he said, what, what can I do? I said, if you'll shut this thing down, I sure would appreciate it. You know, fine. He come, he walked off from me, he turned around, he come back. He said, Bo, he said, how do I do that? I said, if you'll find the key, turn it to the left, I promise you to shut down. Well, you, uh, there's not many people in Sam's County that don't know how to run a tractor at, at that age that's lived in the middle of nowhere in Garland like that. But, you know, Jason's, he's all right, but kind of special. <laughs> but, uh, he turned around, he shut it down, he turned around, he come back to me, he said, what, 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 you, what can I do now? I said, Bo, I said, if you'll take off and drop your duty belt, I got to have your inner belt get on my thigh, I got to shut that bleeding off too. Gun, everything right down in the dirt. Took that belt, we got it on my thigh, got it tightened down. He said, what now? I said, if you look on the fender of that tractor, there's a Diet Pepsi. I sure would appreciate it if you hand it to me. <laughs> he said, do what? I said, Pepsi. Well, he walked around here, got my Diet Pepsi, come back. Well, he's talking to me and everything. I'm laid back and I'm just, you know, I'm telling him. And with EMA, with uh, the dispatcher is talking to me, I'm telling him, you know, please make sure Christy knows I love her. Tell the children I love them. I, you know, at any time, you know, I'm not, I'm expecting to go in response. I know what happens. I've seen it. I'm expecting to, you know, just that's the go in response and there, there we go. Finish bleeding out before anybody else gets to me. Jason, he kept telling me. He says, he, he said, Nah, you tell her after a while. You tell her after a while. Said, well, Jason is. Uh, he doesn't like blood at all. He's not a blood, he can't deal with blood. And he's covered in it from about head to toe now. And he's sort of in a pickle, don't know what to do, but he ain't got sick yet. He didn't throw up on me. But I'm glad of that. EMS, uh, fire starts arriving. EMS starts arriving. Different deputies, high patrol starts arriving. Um, there's people everywhere around me. Well. Finally, they get me out of this picker, get me loaded on the ambulance, the helicopter circling. We couldn't land in the field due to the debris from the corn. So they moved it, landed it in Garland between the old fire department and the Garland Shirt Company. At that time when I got there, um, the door opened and Christy and my mama were there. I was able to talk with them, pray with them, you know, I've got to see Christy. I'm feeling better about it, knowing at least I got to see Christy. I never thought that I would make it out of this field. Now I made it to where a helicopter is. Well, they, uh, the helicopter crew got in the truck. I dealt with them before in the past. I knew them. Um, and well, they were talking to me, doing different things to me. They get me off this helicopter. Get me out of the ambulance and then move me to the helicopter. We get me in the helicopter, we talk for a minute, it lifts off. Well, when it lifts off, the pilot, there's over, they're gonna forget about that. Got a bad past it. Yeah. Pilot looks down. He says, Y'all look at this. Does anybody know what that is? Per circle. Per circle. Well, the uh, crew on that helicopter, it just blew their mind. They, they didn't know what to think about it. Well, we left 
and got to do, later they would tell us that they got to do five minutes faster than they had from our area before they hit a tailwind when they got up in there. They uh, got to do, went into the ER, spent 23 minutes in the ER. I had left the ER and went to OR for about 12, 15 hours. Chrissy would get there when she'd walk in, they would send her to a OR waiting room. The first thing that they'd tell her when she got there, the secretary said, they're working on him, he's in surgery, they've already amputated his foot. She didn't have any idea that it was as bad as that. She knew I was hurt, but she didn't have any idea that I was losing my foot. And um, I would come out of the OR. They said I talked to them with no problem going in the ER, going to OR, come out of the OR, intubated on a ventilator. And over the next few days, they would back me off of it a little bit. Well, they would take me back for surgery for a revision for them to clean the wounds and they'd end up taking a little more off each time. Initially, the first night, they saved my right arm and they took my right foot off. That was it. Everything else, you know, those were the injuries I had. Well, I lost, I had about 14, 15 pints of blood the first night. The next few days, I would start to run a temp. 106, 107, 108. I would, my organs started shutting down. Kidneys, liver, everything shutting down. They had me on dialysis. They can't figure out what in the world is going on. They've got me on antibiotics. Well, they told my family, you know, he's pretty much, he's got two hours to live. This is it. Well, the next morning, that was about 8 o'clock one night. The next morning, I'm still alive. Middle of the day, I'm still alive. That evening, I'm still alive. I'm swole up big as the Michelin man. Got a temperature of 108. And... They don't have a clue. Well, all of a sudden, they said a little girl comes in. We got it. We got it. It's a fungus. Called a fungus from the dirt. This fungus is only found in southeastern North Carolina and northeastern South Carolina in an area about 150 miles wide and about 250 miles long. The only place in the world that is found. 99% of the time when this fungus is found, it's on an autopsy report because it takes so long for it to grow out. Well, they give me the antifungals, and you know, I'm starting to get better, they give me the antifungals, everything. Within 72 hours, my organs are back to functioning. I had been, I'd had so much trouble with keeping blood pressure up that they had put me on so many pressors that my left foot was just as black as the bottom of these chairs. I would end up, when it was said and done, that they thought I was going to lose that left foot also. Where the only thing that I ended up losing was part of one toe on my left foot. The uh, doctors, they were, they were, some of the surgeons like, you know, we need to go and take this off, we need to do that. And there was an old doctor that was there, and he'd come in, he's like, no, we're just going to leave that alone. We're going to see what the body's going to do for it. If the body rejects it, then we'll go from there. But as long as it looks like there's any kind of pinkness to it, we're going to let it go. Well, I was waking up at this point. I didn't realize what all had happened. I, you know, I knew I'd got hurt. I knew I'd been in a corn, in a picker, in a, the field, in a farming accident. I didn't have no idea what had happened after I, I got to do it and went to OR. Didn't have no clue. Really, the last thing that I remembered was going up in this helicopter 
and talking to Patrick Farr, and him saying, Kyle, I might have to put you down to slow you down, try to slow your heart rate down to calm you down. I said, brother, do what you got to do. That's the, that's the last thing I remember. Well, when I wake up, I don't have no arm on this side. I don't have a leg, I don't have a knee. I've got my legs cut off at right above the knee. What good is a one-legged, one-armed man? What good is he? Depression, ladies and gentlemen, was terrible. Depression will kill you. The next few weeks, they would have me on a pain pump. They'd come in and ask me what my pain was. It was a 10 or 12, it was something outrageous. I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to sleep. I didn't want to have any part of it. What are my children going to think of me now? What am I going to do? How am I going to provide for my family? Well, my children would come in and see me. I'd, they'd hop right on up in the bed with me. Didn't pay anything, any attention. They were fussed at, oh, don't pull that out. They'd pull it on the IVs, everything else. Well, me and Christy would talk, no, and I was like, she finally, she said, Kyle, look, we can't live up here. We've got to get home. We've got three children. We've got to get home. We've got to go on with life. Yeah, I know it's, it's hurt your feelings. You're upset because you don't have but one arm and one leg now, but you're alive. We've got to go on with life. Well, I would get a little bit better with depression. It was still tough. I'd get a little bit better with it, a little bit better. And um, like when I went into the hospital, I was strong as a mule. I could do anything and everything I wanted to and about with whatever I wanted to. At this point, I can't pick my head off off the bed. I'm just laying there. I'm, you know, I can move my arms some up, but I can't sit up on my own. I can't roll over on my own. I can't do anything. Well, I would stay at Duke for 70 days with most of the time one-on-one -on -one with a nurse. I'd have one nurse to one patient ratio. Sometimes, once in a while, they might have two patients, but most of the time they just have one with me. I spent 70 days there. On January the 1st, 2015, they would move me to a rehab facility at Southeastern Rehab at Cape Fear Valley. I turned 34 in the hospital at Duke. It's right after the first year. I missed all through deer season. I slept through deer season, bear season. And now they've moved me to a rehab facility and they're 34 years old, they throw me in a nursing home. I don't have that one-on-one -on -one care no more. Christy has had to go home. She'd been with me for 70 days other than just going home to wash clothes, do laundry, take care of things that the children had going on. She'd been with me. Well, I got used to that. Now I'm in a rehab facility that to me feels like a nursing home. I'm at the end of a hall on a dead end hall. I've got a window that's about 18 inches across and I can't even see out the door the way this bed is. I cried the whole time, demolished. Depression was terrible. Well, a lot of things would happen the next couple of days. I'd go right back, revert right back with the depression. Well then, me, Christy would come and she, well she talked them into letting me, let her sign me out to go out to eat. Well, this is the first time in I, 74, five, six days, 
I was at this point, I was able to sit up on my own. I couldn't stand up, but I could sit up. And I could transfer with a lot of help with two people helping me from a wheelchair to a car. We went out to eat. Well, that was the first taste of being back in real life again. And that sort of lit a fire in me. I wanted to go home so bad. I wanted to get back to Parkersburg. Right downtown Parkersburg. Does anybody know where that's at? Everybody is right. Right outside of Garland, between there and Roseburg. Well, I would make it back, had to go out to eat and come right back, be put back in my bed, and I just, oh, it was just a devastating. Well, they messed up the next day. They told me, they said, Kyle, if you can get where you can transfer with assistance from one person, we'll let you go home. That lit a fire under me. Now, they would ask me to do five repetitions. I'd do 10. They'd ask me to do 10. I'd do 15. I was doing so much that I'd ask them to put me back to bed at lunchtime so I could get a nap. 14 days at rehab, they let me go home. That was one of the best days I could ever remember of being able to, like, just it. It just being able to go back home and see home. They, uh, they said, well, we'd write for you to stay for a while longer. I said, there's enough old people. There's enough retired people. I got enough friends. I'll catch a ride to therapy. I'm out of here. Let me go. Well, I would, uh, over the next month and a half, I would get through therapy nonstop. I had a Probably uh, the week after I got out of rehab, I received my first prosthetic leg. Well, a month and a half after that, maybe a month and a half after I got out of the hospital, out of rehab, my daughter had a play at school. Well, she goes to an AG school in Clarkton. And so, Eric Christie would have to help me get dressed and all this. Well, I got dressed. Everything, I ain't said nothing to anybody because I didn't want to hear anybody's mouth. And it wasn't anybody going to change my mind. As soon as Christy got gone good, everything else had calmed down. I took my wheelchair, I rolled it outside, got my truck, I took off to Clarkton. Got out with my crutches, a crutch, because you know you can't run but one with one arm. Took my time, went in, sat down. I cried through the entire thing. I never thought I'd see this again. Never thought I'd be able to go to events like this. And now I'm 30 miles from home and watching it. And everybody, they were like, Larson, your daddy's crying there. She's like, daddy, you okay? You hurt? And I was like, no, mm -mm. you just don't understand, baby. Well, through therapy and the dear Lord had brought me through this, brought me this far. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have made it that far. I am, now I do pretty much anything and everything I want to. I spoke at the University of Tennessee last month for FSA. I drove, I, I'm in Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill all the time. I'm all up and down the East Coast doing different things. I've had my sawmill retrofitted so that I can run it. It's a portable sawmill. Um, the children, I might be late for a game, but I'll be there. I might miss a little bit of practice, but I'll be there. Everybody, the guys that work with my daddy and them, they're, they're the world's worst. Boy, we'll go pick up the Lathan or Gabe. You, you need to stay here. No, I got it. 3.30, no matter where I'm at, what I'm doing, I'm at home to get them off the bus, four o'clock. We do homework, we do whatever. Whatever I didn't finish today, we'll get it tomorrow. Family and your children are one of the most important things, ladies and gentlemen. Spending time with them, being around them. And just don't take the little things for granted. You know, before I, and, and now, I don't know how in the world 
we ever did the things that we do when I was working full time. Because it, I just don't understand, I don't see how it can happen, could have happened. Well, um, I do a lot of uh, safety classes for different individuals, for different schools, for different, uh, for Farm Bureau. I go to, I, I'm doing, start, I'm fixing to start on a program for the Outdoor Network, the Christian Outdoor Network. I'm doing two, uh, two classes for them for hunting extravaganzas in Louisiana and in Mississippi, I'm sorry, Alabama. And if uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, you, you miss how it used to be. If it was like it used to be, I'd be in a rut. I'd have missed out on this much more to family, on this much more to children. And now I'm able to like them. See it. Excuse me. I'm able to, to enjoy life. I go all the time, I do anything and everything I wanted to. Yeah, I have to do it a little different or with help, but at least I'm able to do it. That beats the alternative. Um, being prepared for a farm emergency. You, uh, I know that the class that asked me to come speak and everything to start with were, was your um, animal science class. Things could happen at any time. How many people have looked under the hood of their car? Have you ever seen that sticker that says, turn engine off before changing fan belt? How many of you seen it? They made that for me. They made that for me. Because no matter, you know, you think about it, you say, man, that's crazy. Somewhere, somehow, somebody somewhere has tried it. If not, they wouldn't have put a sticker on there. You know what I mean? When you're dealing with a piece of equipment, not really just with equipment, but electricity, electricity, water, any kind of pumps, or anything that is not you, shut the power off from it, shut the motor off from it, what got me was a PTO, electronic PTO shift, electric PTO shifter, shorted out at the right time or the wrong time, whatever you might say. The, uh, if the motor would, if I shut that motor off, it couldn't have come on. It couldn't have flipped and tripped and done whatever it did. However, if the good Lord wouldn't have had this plan for me, uh, being able to go out and see different folks speak in different places and all, then I wouldn't have had a chance to do that if I would have done it at that point. But that's behind me. There's no sense in worrying about the past. If you are uh, dealing with different farms, different fields, where I was at in this field was, like I said, a half mile off highway. You know, my family knew where I was at. Daddy, mama knew where it was at. Everybody knew where it was at. How'd I tell the ambulance where it's at? I am in the, excuse me, let me turn this off. I am in the field behind the cell phone tower behind Eddie Carter's house. That's where I told him. And um, now looking back on it, a little thing, a few things I do different with my fields. To start with, when I, the fields that we own, I already radically have it. The fields that we lease the farm, I take and get a physical address or a close to a physical address on that field as possible. Second of all, I get a, uh, I name the fields. I'm gonna use one of Mr. Kenneth Fan's signs here. How many times have you seen a sign like this around Sam's County on your back of land? Well, this is something that I do with all mine. I name the fields, and I have a physical address with them, also a GPS address, so that I can, daddy and mama gets a book with everything in it. 
I have a book in my truck with everything in it, with all the addresses, the field names, field numbers, GPS coordinates, and then my father-in-law has one at shop. That way that if something were to happen, then there was three different people that's got the address to this field, the GPS coordinates to this field. That way it would make it easier for someone to respond to you if there was an incident in this area. Another thing we do is accountability. Anybody that's ever dealt with a fire department, they know about accountability. You know, you're fighting fire, you want to know how many people are on scene, how many people are fighting fire, how many people are in rehab, how many people are, where's everybody at? That's pretty much what it is. Where's everybody at? Well, we jot down um, where everybody's at, what they're doing to start with. Okay. And then if they move from that field, they call me or they call, send me a message or they call daddy. If you can't get up with me, you can't get up with daddy, they call my father-in-law or they call Christy. No matter what's going on, send a message when you move. That way, not only just for safety purposes, but also if something tears up or something breaks down, say the phone went dead. You know, if I know that job should have took 30 minutes and I hadn't heard from them in an hour, I'm gonna call and check on them. Hey, what's going on? You all right? Yeah, I put a little bit more emphasis on that than most farmers do because of the situation that I was put into. The, uh, another thing is, is like with the, when we're dealing with, the, with cows and stuff, um, other than just feeding, if we're moving cows or if we're doing something, we always got two of us. Because at any time, if you're dealing with an animal, they've got a mind of their own, literally. You know, they can make their own decisions. They, you're not sitting there, and you park them here, they're not gonna move. When cow, if you dad gonna have him standing here in 10 seconds, he's gonna turn around, he's gonna do something. Well, um, my father-in-law was kicked about a year and a half, two years before, well, about three years before I got hurt in the face by a horse. All this is destroyed. Had to have reconstructive surgery on it. He had to have uh, implants put in, top and bottom. Had to have bone grafts put in. Sinuses. They had to go in and rebuild his sinuses. And if he would have been by himself when that happened, it was in loading a horse into a horse trailer. If he'd been doing it when it happened and he had fell right there, there's a possibility he could have been stomped. The horse could have kicked him again. You know, there's a lot of things that could have happened. But when he was hit, kicked in the face like that, he was able to, the guy that was with him was able to slide him out from under the horse because he was, one horse kicked him and the other horse fell right under another. But anytime you're dealing with live animals, have somebody else with you or in the close vicinity to you. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> any questions about anything? Driving. How many people have rode in Santa Cana with that seatbelt on? I'm the world's worst. I'm the world's worst. The, uh, the chances of something happening are a whole lot greater on the highway than they are on anywhere else, really. What's the most hazardous work in the world, or the United States, I know? Agriculture. Agriculture. And, you know, you don't think about it. But all these fields that you see, all these hog farms you see, all these turkey farms, chicken farms, those are agriculture jobs. They are bringing money in to not just to the, the people that own them, but the people that work there. They're putting the people in the processing, you're like Smithfield or House of Rayford, they're putting those people in a job. That's agriculture related jobs. Spraying. 
I've lost friends over the years and known of people that have been spread and got overtaken by the, the fumes, by the chemical, by a wreck, turned over. I had a good friend last year, last um, summer. He's actually, uh, he was an agronomist for the state of North Carolina and retired. And of, he was going down the road with a tractor and a sprayer with big booms long, that would come up beside the front of the tractor. Who do you think he got in a wreck with and killed? His wife. His wife, of all people. The, uh, there's so many different ways to get hurt dealing with agriculture. There's so many ways that you don't ever think about. There's, you know, dealing with hay, the string on the hay. It would be very easy for a child to be playing with a, a string, a hay string and hang yourself. Anything that you start to do, not dealing with agriculture or anything, look at it. Say, you know, what could I do? How could I get hurt with this? If you think about that for a minute when you look at something, then you, you have an idea of what the, the hazards are, but more than likely you're going to miss 15% or more of the hazards. Think about anything and everything you do. If you're in a hurry, accidents happen quicker. Any questions? Feel free, ask me anything. I have, uh, I was, had worked with the county. Um, I'd been a paramedic in the state retirement system for almost 17 years. I was able to get a medical retirement from EMS. I wasn't able to go back doing the same job I was. Um, I, now, like, I enjoy life. I, I go out and about do what I want to. I have a uh, Autobot right knee and this uh, I am working with different companies trying out different products on their legs because they tear up so easy uh, they'll break they'll just they're made for people that aren't going to use them insurance companies will kick on it if you uh, if you had to get a leg over so often but I have to this day not had one that lasted outside of this warranty period. I even had uh, Freedom Knees was the first knees I started out with and they couldn't hold up. And there was a little bitty clause in there, you know, that fine print at the bottom of the page, that if they cannot keep you in a leg for so long and it do what you need to do, that they will purchase you one that will work. I was the first one they ever bought. They bought me all the box. And Autobach, I have been through everything with Autobach. I should be getting a power knee and a power foot within the next, I don't, I, probably six to eight weeks. And a power knee is uh, sort of like you see when you think about Terminator, where when you move, it actually moves with you. This knee here is an Autobach knee, and it's electric. I have to plug it in every night, I have to charge it. If it's not charged, it won't walk. This new knee I'm getting, It'll be able to, when I go up to climb up a stair, set of stairs, I go up and I climb with this foot up, and then I bring that one up back and forth with a power knee. It's just like a regular leg up and down, bouncing right on up. My right arm, I have a prosthetic arm. However, my arm, I don't have it about four inches of to hold that arm on with. So by not having enough to hold that arm with, I can, it is a, uh, you can't, it, the weight of it pulls it off. We're working on trying to figure that out, getting something that could actually hold it on, vacuum on it, that would hold it on to keep it from sliding down. The uh, arm is like a regular robot arm. It's got five fingers, and I have went in here. They went on the inside of my arm. When your nerves come down, open my arm back up, Separated the nerves out. I have one here, 
one here and one on this side. You know, your different nerves that go down your arm, like the thumb and this finger are on one, the middle of your palm and the right side are on another nerve. Well, they took the nerves and they separate them apart. They put them in something like conduit. And that way the prosthetic arm will go over it, interact, and just like I'm moving the hand, moving whatever, you know, fingers, just like normal. Um, also, I go to the doctor about once a week. I won't say, you know, like medical doctor, you're thinking. Um, I go to medical doctor, my regular medical doctor, Dr. John Smith here in town. I go to Duke, to the amputee clinics. I go to what I call the leg fairy. She's my prosthetic. Prosthesis. I don't say that too fast. And I'm all the time going to different, different doctors for different things, different programs. I'm always going, having to go. Um, I'm working with Dr. Sindalis. Dr. Sindalis is the doctor doing the arm transplants, the hand transplants at Duke. She has done about 30 to this point, and they are working. However, they are from the elbow down. Mine being above the elbow, still a lot of research to go on there as far as trying to figure that elbow out and all the functions on it. So when we get this elbow figured out, and there is a huge, a huge amount of people doctors, uh, interns, therapists, everybody that are doing research and students doing research on this arm transplant. You know, imagine that, that the outcome that that would have for that, you know, this is North Carolina people, Duke, right here in North Carolina, they're able to do this. It's not something halfway across the world or Germany or somewhere that they say are more in advance. North Carolina. Um, let's see what else I've got for you tonight. The uh, the arms and the legs, they are doing um, what now what they call a uh, implant, where they take go into the bone. And you know, if you've seen a hip replacement, knee replacement, things like that, where they actually go in the bone, they take the knee joint out on a knee replacement, and they put spikes up into the bone and glue it. Pretty much how a knee replacement goes. They're doing one of those with legs and with arms, so that they would actually put it in there, there would be a stainless steel barb sticking out, inch, inch and a half long on the arm, two to three inches on the leg and it would, your prosthetic leg would attach to that. And the healing time, they're trying to get that down to where, you know, anytime you put something foreign in the body, you have a chance of it being rejected. You have a chance for infection. So as soon as they can get that, you'll see a lot more, um, a lot more innovation coming around with that shortly. Any questions about anything? Um, I was right-handed. I've had to learn how to write left-handed. I can um, do pretty good. I ain't got to the point that I will freely write a check, but um, I'm almost there. You know, it, it's a, a big change. Lathan has to do spelling words and write them like five times each, and sometimes I'll sit there with him and I'll write them right along with him. Relearn everything. I can't even wave with my right hand. I learned how to wave with left hand. Any question? Anything? Feel free. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
And that's like, you know, you turn back around and I was bad enough as having, at having bad habits. But it seems like the older you get with farmers, the worse the habits get. And um, the, the habits, a habit is a habit. It doesn't matter if it's smoking, drinking, whatever. You get used to doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And all it takes is that one time. One time, your reaction time's down. You know, anything can happen at any time. It's not gonna get you when you're at the top of your game. It's gonna get you when you're, in the, when you're tired, when you're not paying attention, things like this. Any other questions? You keep waving back there, you sure? <laughs> Well, I would like to tell you I thank you for allowing me to come and speak. And if you have any questions at any time, um, you can email me, call me, find me on Facebook, whatever, and I'll get back to you just as soon as I can. Um, I enjoy going out and speaking. I like being around people. I'm nobody important. I'm just somebody that good Lord thoughts time, good person to leave here, I reckon. And I'm glad he did. Thank y'all.